Hey everybody, this is an accompanying video to the lecture on thermal physics, heat and temperature, specific heat capacity. In this video, I'm going to go through five practice problems of varying difficulty related to specific heat capacity. Problem one, you need to raise the temperature of 128 grams of water from 14.2 degrees to 85.5 degrees C. How much heat is needed to accomplish this? The specific heat of water is 4186 joules per kilogram degree C. So here's our specific heat capacity C. We are raising our temperature from this temperature, so that's our initial temperature, to this final temperature, T final. And this is the mass of our water, M. We're going to use the equation Q equals MC delta T. We're solving for how much heat, so that's our Q. <coughs> um, so that's already solved for the, us. Uh, we're just going to need to plug in numbers. However, one little thing we notice, mass is in grams, and specific heat capacity is in joules per kilogram degree C. So we're going to have to convert one to make sure the units are the same. I'm going to convert the grams. 128 grams is 0 0.128 kilograms. So now we just plug in. Mass is 0 0.128 kilograms. Uh, C is 4186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And our delta T is final minus initial. T final is 85.5 degrees Celsius. Our initial is 14.2 degrees Celsius. Our units cancel. And we're left with units of joules. You just plug into a calculator. Make sure our delta T is in parentheses. And we get 38,203 joules, or 38.2 kilojoules, to correct sig figs. And it is positive because we are raising the temperature. OK, next question. A 75 gram sample of copper is at 305 Kelvin. If 885 joules of energy are added to the copper, what is the final temperature? Assume the specific heat of copper is 387 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Here's our specific heat capacity. This is our initial temperature. This is the heat that's added. This is our mass. We're solving for final temperature, T final. Again, notice our Mass is in units of grams, and our specific heat has units of kilograms in it. So we're going to convert one. I'm going to convert the mass. 75 grams is 0 0.075 kilograms. So now let's write out our equation. Q equals mc delta T. We're solving for, well, we're solving for final temperature. That's going to be within the delta T. So let's divide both sides by mc we get Q over MC equals delta T, which is T final minus T initial. To get T final on its own, add T initial to both sides, and I get T final equals Q over MC plus T initial. I just plug in my numbers. Q is 885 joules divided by M. 0 0.075, remember it's in kilograms, and our C is 387 it's joules per kilogram of Kelvin. Add that to the initial temperature, 305 Kelvins. And my T final is, oops, happens a lot, T final is equal to, plug it into a calculator, 85 over 0 0.075. Times three. <coughs> 0 0.075. Make sure 387 is also in the denominator. Add 305 to it. The final temperature is 335 <coughs> Kelvins. <coughs> Level 2. When a driver brakes an automobile, friction between the brake discs and the brake pads convert part of the car's 
translational kinetic energy to internal energy, which is uh, thermal energy. If, 1433 kilogram, if a 1433 kilogram automobile traveling at 16 meters per second comes to a halt after its brakes are applied, how much can the temperature rise in each of the steel brake discs? The total mass of the brake discs is 12.4 kilograms. Assume the discs are made of iron with specific heat capacity 448 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. And that all of the kinetic energy is distributed in equal parts to the internal energy of the brakes. So here we have a conversion of energy from one type to another. We start out with the car's kinetic energy and it gets converted to uh, thermal energy in the brakes. So what we can do is we can set the initial kinetic energy of the car to the heat added to the brakes. Well, our kinetic energy initial is just one half times the mass of the car times the speed of the car squared. And the heat added to our brakes is equal to the mass of the brakes, specific heat capacity of the brakes, times the change in temperature of the brakes. Got a lot of <coughs> slide skipping. Okay, so we're solving for the temperature rise, so that's delta T. We need to make sure we have these other four variables. Here's the mass of the car. Here's the initial velocity of the car, initial speed of the car. This is the mass of the brakes. And this is the specific heat capacity of the brakes. So all we need to do is solve for delta T. We just divide both sides by mass of the brakes, specific heat of the brakes. We get, come over here, delta T equals 1 half mass of the car, speed squared, over mass of the brakes, specific heat of the brakes. Plug in our numbers, 1 half times 1433 kilograms times 16 meters per second squared divided by mass of the brakes is 12.4 kilograms and the specific heat is 448 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. That should give us our delta T. Plug it into a calculator. 0.5 times 14.33 times 16 squared, divided by 12.4, divided by 4.48. We get a delta T of 33.0 degrees Celsius. That's a pretty significant temperature increase. It's unlikely that all of that kinetic energy goes into the brake disc, but that's the maximum possible temperature increase. Okay, problem number four. A 1.5 kilogram rock is dropped off a cliff into a cylinder filled with 3.5 kilograms of water. If the temperature of the water increases by 0 0.156 kelvins after the impact, what is the height that the rock was dropped from? Assume that all of the rock's kinetic energy is converted to thermal energy in the water upon impact. So, here again we have a conversion of energy. We start with a rock, it has potential energy. As it falls, that gets converted to kinetic energy. And then when it lands in the water, it becomes thermal energy in the water. So we can set the potential energy of the rock, the initial potential energy of the rock, equal to the thermal energy in the water to see and figure this out. The potential energy of the rock is m times g, well, m of the rock times g of the rock times h of the rock, initial. And q equals mass of the water, c of the water, times delta t of the water. Now let's see. We want to find what is the height that the rock was dro dropped from. So we're solving for height of the rock. We need to have all the other variables. Here's the mass of the rock. Here's the mass of the water. Here's the change in temperature of the water. Um, and the specific heat capacity of water isn't given, but that's something we can look up. We know C for water is 4186 joules per kilogram Kelvin. 
So to solve for h, we just divide both sides by m, g, mass of the rock, g, mass of rock, g, mass of rock, g, cancel, cancel. We get the height is equal to m of the water, c of the water, delta t of the water, over mass of the rock, g. Plug in every single time. Um, 3.5 times 4186 times 0 0.156 divided by 1.5 times 9.81. The height is then going to be 3.5 times 4186 times 0 0.156 divided by 1.5 divided by 9.81. Whoo, quite high. 155 meters. That's very high. Um, this is probably not a particularly realistic problem. Uh, I don't know if the water would be able to stop a rock that fell from that height. <coughs> but uh, that is the answer. Last problem. It's level three, and it's it's not particularly harder than the other problems. It's just you have to be a lot more careful with your algebra. So this is a level three problem just because of the algebra. Milk with a mass of 0.024 kilograms and a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius is added to 0.20 kilograms of chai tea at 94 degrees Celsius. What is the final temperature? Assume the specific heat capacities of the two liquids are the same as water, and disregard any energy transfer to the liquid surroundings. So what we have here, we don't have really a conversion of energy, we have a transfer of energy. We have some milk, I'm going to label it M, and we have some T, I'm going to label it T. And they're mixed together. The milk starts at um, 15 degrees Celsius. T initial M equals 15 degrees Celsius, and the T starts at T initial T is equal to 94 degrees Celsius. We mix them together, and so heat is going to flow from the high temperature object to the low temperature object. It's going to flow from the tea to the milk. But eventually, they're going to come to the same final temperature. And that's what we're looking for. What is the final temperature? So we know for the two objects, the final temperature is the same. We also know that any heat that the T loses is transferred into the milk. So we could say that Q for the T and Q for the milk are just opposite each other. Whoops. <coughs> um, so they have the same heat, well really the opposite heat, and the same final temperature. So let's, uh, well one other thing we know is that the specific heat for both of them is just the specific heat of water, which is 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. So I'm going to solve this one algebraically, and then I'll plug in numbers at the end, but the algebra is going to get a little complicated, so bear with us. We're going to start with the fact that our heat, negative QM, are equal and opposite. Negative QM equals QT. Well, Q equals MC delta T. So for our milk, it's going to be negative. QM is equal to negative mass of milk, specific heat capacity of water, it's all the same, times T final minus T initial for the milk. On the other side, QT is going to be mass of the T, specific heat of water, times T final, which is the same for both objects, minus T initial for the T. Okay, well right off the bat we see we have C on both sides, so let's cancel that to make it a little easier. Um, now I'm going to distribute out this these mass terms to both of our temperatures. We're going to get negative mass of the milk, T final, and we distribute that here, plus, because it's negative and a negative, 
mass of milk, T initial milk. And on the right side, mass of the T times T final minus mass of the T, T initial of the T. Very annoying, I apologize. Uh, we need to get the final temperature, the two final temperatures on the same side in order to isolate them. So I'm going to move this term to the right side, and I'm going to move this term to the left side by adding or subtracting. Our left side then becomes mass of milk, T initial milk, plus mass of T, gosh, T initial, T equals mass of T, T final, plus mass of milk, T final. Now since I'm solving for T final, and it's in both terms on this side, now I can factor it out, and it becomes, geez louise, T final times mass of T plus mass of milk. Now, I can just divide both sides by this quantity, mass of T plus mass of milk. Divide it on both sides, T plus mass of milk. And, and then I will have solved for my T final. So I'm going to write out the full final equation over here. T final equals, literally can't write one thing, come on, uh, mass of milk. T initial milk plus mass of T, T initial T, divided by mass of T plus mass of milk. Okay, plug in our numbers. Mass of milk, <coughs> 0 0.024 times T initial milk times 15, divided by, well, actually, plus mass of T, T initial T, 0 0.20 times 94, divided by the sum of the two masses, 0 0.20 plus 0 0.024. And I plug those in to get my final answer, 0 0.024 times 15 plus 0 0.20 times 94, divided by 0 0.2 plus 0 0.024. I get a final temperature of 85, 85.5 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Celsius to two sig figs. There's our level, pre, level three problem. Um, and that should cover most of the range of problems you encounter on the quest. Um, hope that was helpful. Have a great day. Bye.